All right, folks, it is 12.01, so we're going to get started. Um, while people trickle in, I'll just do a little bit of an intro into, the, into today's session. Uh, so today we are talking about understanding the infection cycle on your farm, targeting effective disease management with Dr. Paul Hildebrand. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping. So all participants will have their audio and video turned off during the webinar. Please make sure that your name displayed on your Zoom profile matches your pesticide license name if you're looking for pesticide points. Um, so if it's not showing your name currently, you can right click on your picture and change that. Um, down at the bottom, it should say rename. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please use either the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen or the chat feature. Uh, Sajid Remen, um, our plant pathologist at Perennia will be monitoring that. Uh, and please keep an eye on the chat function as some links will be posted there for pesticide points and at the end of the session uh, for an after session survey. Uh, so a little bit about Perennia. Our vision is that Nova Scotia is a recognized world leader in producing innovative, environmentally responsible, safe food of impeccable quality. And our mission is supporting growth, transformation and economic development in Nova Scotia's agriculture, seafood and food and beverage sectors. Prenny is a multifaceted company servicing food and beverage producers from field to fork. This workshop is the first session of the third season of our winter webinar series, Getting Into the Weeds, hosted by our agriculture services team. Sessions like these are part of our extension program. We develop workshops and other trainings, as well as offer production advice, infield disease and pest identification, management advice, help addressing emerging and critical industry issues, and help producers be environmentally and economically sustainable. Part of the Ag Services team also includes our field research team. We offer a comprehensive trial and research support on contract. Our company has grown quite a bit in the last few years. Our food, and safe, our food safety team helps producers and processors meet their food safety goals through training and on-site assessments. Our product development team has been doing some really neat things with businesses in Nova Scotia, assisting them in creating new products, fine-tuning processes, improving shelf life, and so forth. Recently, Perennia launched the Food and Beverage Business Accelerator Program, abbreviated as FABA, which I've been told is fabulous, with the goal to support Nova Scotia producers and, no and food and beverage processors in increasing revenues and profits by assisting them in getting more products successfully to market, as well as opening new markets for current and new producers. You can check out our website for more information, which is perennia.ca if you're not familiar with it. Perennia has also started offering some lab services. We have a plant health lab that is working with the grape and small fruit industries to do virus testing. The most recent addition to the Perennia lab team is in-house plant pathology services that uses, that uses classical and molecular techniques to diagnose plant diseases. We also have a cannabis lab in Churro that provides analytical services. In the last few years, we have also expanded our mandate into the fishery sector. And so we have undertaken initiatives in this area in food safety, product development, and so forth. So for pesticide points, this session is worth one pesticide point. Um, I will post a link in the chat. Uh, so you need to click on that link uh, to get credit for this session. So each uh, to get credit for the session, each participant needs to be watching from their own device. So if you have two people watching on the same computer, only one of you is gonna get credit for this. So maybe log in on your phone as well. Your Zoom name um, should be the name on your pesticide license. I've posted a link in the, or I'll post this link in the chat shortly uh, and fill out your name, address and pesticide certificate number. You must print the screen before submitting done and submit that printed copy when you apply to renew your certification. If you can't figure out how the survey works, email your favorite perennial specialist and they will try to assist you. For all you CCAs out there, you can scan the QR code up in the top left corner of your screen to sign in. It will also be posted at the end of the session. Dr. Paul Hildebrand of Hildebrand Disease Management is a plant pathologist and has provided plant disease diagnostic services and plant disease management advice to the agriculture sector in Nova Scotia. Known to many of you, Paul grew up in a farming community in Leamington, Ontario. Paul got his PhD in plant pathology from the University of Guelph in 1983, which was before I was born, Paul, and then began his career as a research plant pathologist with AAFC. 
He has researched numerous plant diseases of horticulture and agronomic crops, but his main focus was on the epidemiology and management of berry and vegetable crop diseases. I swear every time I'm reading up on a new disease, I stumble across a paper that Paul has published on the topic sometime in the last few decades. Paul retired from AAFC in 2014 and began working as an affiliate plant pathologist for Perennia. He's been working hard to retire from working with Perennia too, but we just won't let him. The 2021 growing season was a good growing season in many ways, but presented a few challenges related to how much precipitation we got. In his last few months with us, we thought that we might tap into Paul's encyclopedic knowledge of the horticulture industry in Nova Scotia. He has some great insights to offer and how infection cycles work on our farms and how we can best manage them through a better understanding of how the disease actually works. Put on your seatbelts, folks. Paul's about to do a deep dive into the weeds. Paul, if you want to share your screen now, um, we can get started. There, how's that? That's great. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Rosie. Um, I thought for today's session, I would talk about uh, what causes a plant disease and uh, what drives it on our farms and uh, what can we do with it or what can we do about it? And uh, in that context, we'll be looking at um, um, some general principles that apply to all diseases. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to come away from today's session with uh, something that you can apply on your farm. So the significance of plant diseases, um, they cause approximately 30 to 40% crop losses annually worldwide. And there are hundreds of billions spent annually trying to control them. And uh, we're part of that statistic. And that really hit home last night if you were watching the news, uh, the tremendous cost that one disease is going to cost the, uh, our fellow uh, growers on the island uh, due to potato wart disease. And uh, it's, a, it's an extremely important disease, but the costs are going to be horrendous if they don't get this sorted out. The other aspect that we'll touch on briefly is climate change. It is a reality and temperatures are increasing, which will enable longer growing seasons. But with this, <clears throat> new pathogens undoubtedly will appear in our area and uh, the disease pressure existing uh, from existing pathogens will likely occur as well. So we're faced with some uh, challenges ahead, but uh, I think we can uh, move, move forward with a, a little bit of optimism. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some principles that uh, you probably haven't heard about before or you haven't really considered it before, but hopefully you'll be able to take these principles and uh, just think about them and apply them to your situation. So in order for disease to start, we need to have three components. We need to have the pathogen, we need to have the host, and we need to have the appropriate environment. And those three together interacting will produce disease. And uh, this, the severity of the disease will depend, will depend on the susceptibility of the host. So the more susceptible that the host is, we'll end up with more disease. The more resistant it is, less disease. Conversely, on the other side, if we've got a highly virulent pathogen, we'll end up with more disease. If it's a weak pathogen, we'll end up with less disease. And then on the bottom, if we have less favorable environmental conditions, we'll have less disease. And uh, the converse is true, we'll have more, more disease if conditions are more favorable. And superimposed on these three factors is time. Time is an important element. Uh, time will drive these three elements. Uh, time can be viewed as uh, time of the year, uh, time of the growing season, or time of the, uh, in the infection cycle. When is, when is the disease happening and what happens after that? And so time can be broken down in various components and we'll have a look at that and uh, take it from there. And of course, we have the human element. This is the fifth layer. And uh, we as humans, we can impact the host, we can impact the pathogen, and we can impact our environment. And sometimes our impacts are favorable 
and sometimes our impacts are less than favorable. We actually are sometimes our own worst enemy. We might be causing bigger problems than what we anticipated by doing some uh, farming practices that we should not be doing. So <clears throat> what, what are these causes of plant disease? So all plant diseases are caused by, uh, by microorganisms. They're all microscopic in nature, you, uh, very difficult to see for the most part. And uh, they fall into five major groups, the fungi and the bacteria, viruses and phytoplasmas. Most of us have never heard of that term of a phytoplasma, but it's, a, it's an interesting organism. It's a cross between bacteria and a virus, if you will. And then we've heard, we've heard certainly a lot about nematodes in the last little bit. And Perini has a big project on doing a survey of nematode populations and species in uh, Nova Scotia. But fungi and bacteria are by far the, the most uh, prevalent uh, of the microorganisms that cause diseases, and we'll be having a closer look at those primarily. Then we also have physiologic disorders, and they can, they can result in similar symptoms, but they're really not diseases. And uh, they can be confused with diseases, but they're really not. And uh, they can be caused by herbicide injury or temperature injury, high temperature or low temperature injury, uh, water or nutrient imbalance, water being too much water, not enough water, a nutrient imbalance can be too much fertilizer, not enough fertilizer, um, or micronutrients, too, much, too many micronutrients or too low on a micronutrient concentration. And it, invariably, many of these uh, symptoms that result from these injuries here <clears throat> appear like these up here. And they can be very confusing, even for a plant pathologist. And sometimes Saja to myself, when Rosie and Michelle and uh, Sunny, we scratch our heads. We say, is this a disease or is it a physiologic disorder? And so we spend some time uh, getting the correct diagnosis. And that's really important. Uh, because that will be ultimately determine the best management strategy that you can implement. And, um, and uh, that's extremely important for um, expenditures too. You don't want to be treating these down here, these injuries with, uh, with these uh, methods of control up here, because that could be a very costly mistake. So it's really important to get the correct diagnosis. So each pathogen then has its own unique infection cycle or we can also call it a life cycle. And uh, it starts with the overwintering or survival stage. And because the, most of these, or all of these pathogens, they don't have legs, they are looking for a new home. So they, from the overwintering stage, they have to find a new home. And the only way they can do that is by reproduction. They have to produce more of themselves and uh, that can be, that's usually in the form of spores or increased numbers in the case of bacteria or viruses or nematodes. After reproduction, it has to spread itself to a new host. It's looking for new territory to invade. And so we have the dispersal phase of a pathogen. And after the dispersal phase, the, the, uh, the, the organism lands on a new host and uh, it has to get into the host to cause disease or to cause problems or to perpetuate itself. And we call that the germination or the infection stage. And after the infection stage, we have the colonization stage. And uh, that's where the pathogen will multiply inside the host and uh, consume its nutrients. And ultimately then we get symptoms developing. But very often in the colonization stage, there's a latent period, we call that latency, where the fungus or the bacteria, or the virus, they're doing things inside the plant, but they're really not visible to the human eye. And so that's the latent period. And after the latent period is finished, then we see the symptoms. And after the symptoms appear and all the nutrients are, are sucked up from the plant, the pathogen will go into reproduction again because it has says, I need a new home, I have to find a new site, and their cycle is repeated. And this cycle may repeat many times throughout the year, throughout the growing season, or it may, re may repeat only once. And uh, it will go directly to the overwintering stage. And we call that the polycyclic, uh, a polycyclic disease if it cycles more than once. 
And it's a monocyclic disease if it only cycles once in a season or a growing season. And uh, examples of polycyclic diseases, and there are many, um, apple scab, anthracnose of strawberry, I'm just not going to read all of them, uh, pythium, and phytophthora damping off of seedlings or early and late blight of potato and tomato. And then examples of monocyclic diseases are monolinea blight of blueberry. If you're a blueberry grower, you're probably well aware of this disease. Um, <clears throat> white mold of green beans and soybeans, onion smut, corn smut, and club root of brassicas. And just because they're monocyclic diseases doesn't mean that they can cause extent or they can't cause extensive damage because they do. And uh, uh, they also have to be treated with uh, kid gloves because they are very important diseases. So let's have a closer look at what, uh, what is the overwintering and survival stage? Uh, what's going on with a pathogen? And we'll, we'll take each of these components apart and look at them in, in uh, careful detail. And then we'll have a closer look at uh, what we can do about them. The overwintering survival stage <clears throat> um, uh, is, is an important stage because that uh, allows the pathogen to survive long cold weather or even even long periods of time over many, many seasons. And uh, many pathogens can survive in the plant debris itself. So as the plant is decaying, that decayed material may be just laying on the surface soil or uh, even on a greenhouse on the surface soil or on the greenhouse um, uh, grow, uh, planting benches or where have you, uh, it's able to survive in plant debris. <clears throat> And many, many fung fungi or fungal pathogens, they also produce specialized fungal structures. And some of these pathogens survive only one year, while others can survive for many, many years. And uh, these are just some examples of overwintering or survival structures. On the left-hand corner here, we have a blueberry leaf. This is a low bush blueberry leaf. And it's a disease. Uh, uh, there's an organism called Valdensia heterodoxa. And it can cause a lot of defoliation in low bush blueberry. <clears throat> this disease has only been around for about 10 years or so, maybe 14 years. And in some seasons, it causes a big, big, a big problem. And after the fungus has colonized the entire surface of the leaf, it will gather itself together and colonize just the veins. And it'll, it'll concentrate its growth on these veins and it'll produce a very, very hard structure. And that's called a sclerotium. Here's another example of a survival structure. This is called a pycnidium. And uh, several pycnidia uh, can be seen on this blueberry stem. And uh, this one here survives only about one year. Spores are produced in this structure here. And we'll see that in a moment. In the right-hand corner, we have a, an organism called Phytophthora fregarii. And this organism causes red steel of strawberry. And it produces a very, a uh, small spore, specialized spore, it's called an ooze spore, and it can survive in the soil for up to 25 years. <clears throat> and a great deal of effort has been placed uh, on this pathogen by the breeding program, Andrew Jameson's breeding program um, in the, at the Kentville Research Station for many years. And uh, many of the varieties now are resistant, fortunately. And then we have <clears throat> another form of, uh, of overwintering, and this is botrytis, the cause of gray mold of many crops. And this fungus simply likes to survive in, in the dead tissue of, uh, of its host. <clears throat> and it'll just survive in there, and come springtime, it'll, it'll emerge. And uh, this, this survival method is only good for one year. So we have the overwintering stage, then we go to the reproductive stage and the fungus has to move away from here and uh, we have to have the reproduction stage. And uh, reproduction usually begins in, in springtime <clears throat> and we call that the in initial inoculum. The first amount of spores being produced or the first bacteria being released or the first virus being uh, transmitted by, uh, by a, a vector such as an insect, we call all of that initial inoculum. And it usually occurs in response to warming temperatures. <clears throat> usually in April, things are starting to move. May, things are moving faster and so on. And uh, this phase of the, of the reproductive phase of pathogens usually starts at about between five and 10 Celsius. In the summertime, 
uh, reproduction also occurs with these polycyclic pathogens that will cycle more than once. And uh, this occurs in response to depletion of nutrients and infected plant tissue. And there's usually adequate moisture or humidity and temperatures during the summer are usually favorable for this uh, reproduction to occur. And so it's really not limited as the springtime temperatures are, are sometimes a limiting factor. And here we have an example of Botrytis uh, caused the gray mold. Um, you've all seen it on your petunias as well, on your geraniums. Uh, this, year my gray, uh, this year my petunias didn't do very well. We had a lot of rain. And so we ended up getting a lot of gray mold on, on our petunias. And it's caused by this, the same organism called Botrytis scenario. And it affects strawberries, ornamentals, blueberries, many, many crops. And it uh, produces its spores initially on the, on the dead tissue from where it overwintered. And it's produced on these stalks. And uh, these are the spores that are produced. And we can see the fuzzy growth occurring here. And uh, <clears throat> that's this particular organism's means of producing spores in, in springtime. Here's that same organism that I mentioned earlier, Valdensia. And uh, after it's overwintered, it'll start to produce spores on this tissue. And here's a close up. We've got these large spores. And if you hold this leaf up close to your eye, you'll actually be able to see these spores. They're very large and star-shaped, which is unusual. So that's another mechanism of uh, spore production. Another mechanism is the uh, spore cups of monolinia, the cause of monolinia blight and blueberry. Here we have a sclerotium. It's a colonized blueberry fruit that was colonized the previous summer. And uh, this one can survive several years in the soil. And when the right conditions appear, it'll produce these spore cups, like little wine goblets. They're actually looking like little mushroom, upside down mushrooms. And uh, the inside of this, this uh, cup here is lined with, uh, with spores, ascospores. And, and uh, if you're an apple grower, you, you're certainly familiar with the term ascospores because you're very concerned about ascospores um, infecting your apple trees early in spring. And uh, the term ascus is simply means a sac containing spores, and that's where the term ascospore comes from. So if we look at this, the lining here of the, uh, this spore cup, it, uh, it looks like this under the microscope. With an, in the case of an apple scab leaf, um, this structure is very, very tiny. You can't see it. But if you look at it on the microscope, the, the same thing happens there. You get these ascospores appearing. Next is the dispersal phase. <clears throat> the fungus has to, or the pathogen has to move from the reproductive phase. It's got to get around. It's in the search for a new host. So we, we refer to this as the dispersal stage. And fungal spores can be forcibly discharged in response to changes in humidity or moisture. And those types of release or dispersal are usually characterized by a short distance spread. And fungal spores can be dispersed also by wind. Uh, they, can, they can fly short distances or, or long distance or even up to 100 kilometers and even, even more. And uh, this summer we, were, um, we encountered an organism called uh, cucumber downy mildew and we figure it blew up from uh, the Northeastern US and uh, um, each year I'm familiar, I'm watching this particular organism. We've never had it in Nova Scotia before. It starts usually in Georgia and in, in the Carolinas and there are alerts by put out by pathologists up the Eastern coast of the US and it moves its way up the coast. And uh, I suspect that this year was the first year that we had the right weather conditions that blew in spores from possibly Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, those areas which were reported to have the disease and the rainstorms uh, or the windstorms blew those spores up and they landed on our cucumber crop this past season. And this is the first year that that has happened. But you can see that these spores do travel uh, long distances. Fungal spores and bacteria can be splashed about by rain. So if they're splashed about by rain and, and particularly during a wind-driven rain, they can move long distances again, kilometers. And uh, fungal spores and bacteria, they can, uh, and viruses, they can be carried by insects, so short or long distance again. Um, insects can, can fly long distances and aphids, for example, that uh, transmit viruses, uh, they, can be, they can be transported many, many uh, kilometers by riding air currents. <clears throat> and then finally, we have fungal spores and bacteria, viruses, 
and nematodes, they can all be carried on infected plant parts or seed and in the soil. And those can result in short, short distance transport or very long distance transports, um, transport across continents. And of course, we're always uh, concerned about uh, imports from different countries. And uh, that's where CFI gets involved, CFIA gets involved, especially if we have a report of a new organism coming from another country. So <clears throat> on a more local scale, um, these are, this is a picture of ascospores releasing from these spore cups. Um, and they were released, start, they will start to release, they will puff, literally puff out the spores. And you can imagine these spores then, they can easily waft in the breeze and they can spread through a blueberry field quite easily and, and they can spread fairly long distances. Similarly with this gray mold on uh, many vegetable crops and berry crops, uh, the spores are actually produced on these stalks called canidiophores. The spores are also called canidia, a more technical term. But you can see what happens when these spores are on these stalks. You need just a puff of wind to blow these off and they will blow long distances. So these spores all have excellent uh, dispersal mechanisms and uh, that allows them to travel short or long distances and they just happen to land on a, another susceptible crop or within a field. <clears throat> the next phase is the germination infection stage. These pathogens have to enter the, the host somehow. <clears throat> and uh, so in terms of a fungus, the spores or are the seeds of the fungus, um, if you will, they, they germinate very much like a, a bean seed or a corn seed in the soil. They put out a germ tube and we call it a rootlet, we call that a germ tube in terms of a spore, and we'll look at that more closely in a moment. And uh, germination generally, generally occurs over a wide range of temperatures in spring, or in, through the whole season rather, five to 30 degrees, um, <clears throat> usually an optimum, usually at about 15 to 25. And the other component that's necessary is the right temperature, but we also need plant surfaces to be wet. And uh, a rule of thumb is usually more than six to 10 hours from rain or dew. And once the spores germinate, we call those the spore germlings and they will infect, they will actually penetrate into the plant through openings, uh, stomata on the leaves. And we'll have a look at that in a moment through wounds or directly via apressoria. And we'll have a closer look at that as well. Bacteria, on the other hand, uh, they can swim in a film of water. They can move around or they can be driven by rain into natural openings. Uh, again, stomata on the leaves. These are the breathing pores of a leaf. Uh, nectar thodes in flowers. Those are nectar producing pores. Um, hydathodes on the edges of leaves. Or they can enter wounds on plant tissue. And viruses and phytoplasmas are usually injected into plants by sap sucking insects, aphids or leafhoppers and sometimes nematodes. And uh, nematodes themselves, they can enter uh, roots by repeatedly puncturing the roots with a stylet or simply suck the root sap dry and uh, they do that so with their stylet. And we'll just have a quick look at what nematodes look like and then we'll get back to uh, uh, the fungi and the bacteria world. I just wanted to point out uh, what a, a nematode actually looks like. For many of us, we've never seen one. It's a small microscopic worm, but the business end here is the mouth end and it's, it's composed of a stylet. And uh, this is a root lesion nematode. This is the most common nematode that we have in Nova Scotia. And this little stylet acts like a jackhammer. It just punches into the plant, the root cell, the root, the, the root tissue would be right along here. And it just keeps punching and punching and punching and eventually it makes a hole. And then it slithers into the cell and into the root and starts to feed. And it continues to feed by continuous puncturing of the stylet and sucking up the nutrients through the stylet. The other form of feeding of course is the, uh, <clears throat> the dagger nematode. And it has this wonderfully long and awesomely long stylet, looks like a hypodermic syringe. And that's exactly what it is. It will simply puncture a root uh, cell and it'll sit there and feed and it'll suck out all the nutrients and the moisture out of that root cell and then it'll simply move along and puncture another cell and suck out the nutrients. And uh, this particular nematode is associated with transmittance of virus and in Nova Scotia we have a little bit of tomato ring spot virus in blueberry and it can be a problem. <clears throat> um, 
let's get back now to the fungal side of things. Uh, this is the lower, lower leaf surface of a blueberry leaf. And you can see the breathing cells. These are the breathing pores. These are all called stomata or, or a stomate in singular. And uh, uh, they look very different. This is a cell that's made up of two cells actually, and it opens and closes in response to the need for oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. And uh, this is the, the leaf surface cell. It has a wavy puzzle shaped appearance and uh, each, uh, each cell here is fit together quite nicely. And uh, this particular organism causes a disease called spherulina leaf spot. And the spores are very long and slender. And uh, this is a, a magnification of the spores. <clears throat> but once they're on the leaf surface, this is a lower magnification. The spore is about this long here. It has germinated to produce a germ tube and it immediately found an open stomate and whoops, in it goes. The other end of the spore continues to, to germinate and, and grow. It's looking for another stomate. It hasn't found one, one here, but this branch, has found another one very close by, so in it goes, and so on and so forth. You can see all the penetrations occurring on the blueberry leaf. So that's a one, that's a, a an amazing mechanism that fungi have to seek out the stomata, to uh, to enter a, a leaf. And here again is a germ tube. It's entering the stomate. You can see the crack. That's the breathing pore. That's through which the plant breathes but the fungus is taking advantage of that opening and in it goes. There are also apressoria that I mentioned earlier. Uh, gray mold produces apressoria. So we can imagine we've got a spore here, we've got the germ tube here, and this is an apressorium. It's a spore suction cup. And it literally sucks itself down. It glues itself down on the plant surface and uh, it will then send out a uh, a pressure peg and it'll actually penetrate the plant tissue and get into the plant that way. And here's an, a, a typical drawing of a leaf surface. Here's the cuticle, the waxy layer on, the, on, a, on a plant leaf. For example, cabbage is a great example. You can wipe off that waxy layer. Then underneath that layer, we've got the epidermis <clears throat> of, of the outer layer of the leaf then the internal cells. And then we've got the lower uh, epidermis with a, stomat, with a stomate and that's the natural opening. And uh, on the upper surface here, I've depicted what happens with botrytis, the gray mold organism. We've got the spore and it germinates and then it produce a, produces a, an apressorium. And this is a, a hold fast or a suction cup. And it literally penetrates this layer of the plant and pops its, pops its way into the upper layer of the, of the leaf and starts sucking out nutrients growing inside that cell and then it'll wander about and it'll suck up another cell and so on and so forth. And this is the other example of the spore entering the stomate and uh, doing the same thing. So we've got two different pathways that fungi can enter the host. <clears throat> well, all of this requires water and the appropriate temperature. Uh, if it's dry, uh, these spores will not germinate. Just like a bean seed or a corn seed, it will not germinate if the soil is dry. So the spore needs water in order to germinate and it also needs the temperatures to be favorable. And uh, this process is, uh, is starts in the springtime and it cycles in the summertime. And if you're an apple grower, you're well aware of this relationship between apple scab um, infection in related, to, in related to the temperature of the wet period and related to the duration of the wet period. And uh, if it's cold, if, let's say around two degrees, it takes about 40 hours of wetness for these spores to germinate and infect an apple leaf. Um, on the other hand, if the temperature is high, 15 degrees to 23 degrees, we only need six hours of wetness. And so this, rela so this relationship is well known by our apple growers and they, they follow this very meticulously because they wanna know whether or not uh, protection is required from a fungicide or not. And uh, so this is uh, Michelle from Perennia. She puts out a, a, an alert uh, bi-weekly for the apple growers to be aware of what's happening and what the forecast is. Blueberry growers have the same <clears throat> uh, bit of information. It's the same thing happening at low temperatures. Um, we need only, we need 14 hours of wetness. At warmer temperatures, uh, we only need about, at 18 degrees, for example, we only need five hours of wetness. And so the blueberry growers are well aware of this uh, relationship as well. 
So I want to talk a little bit about uh, 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 climate change at this point in time. Uh, climate change is a reality, as I mentioned at the outset. Um, <clears throat> the temperatures are in fact rising. Uh, this, this report just came out recently in November. CBC reported on a paper published uh, by two scientists here in Nova Scotia um, from Acadia University as well as St. of X University. And they have a, they've shown a clear relationship of temperature increasing from 1961 to 1920. And that's a remarkable shift in temperature. On a year to year basis, we can see there's a lot of variability between the years, but on average, our temperatures are increasing. And that becomes important because we are gradually increasing on the scale. And so we need lower, we need fewer wetness hours in order for infection to occur. The more we move this way, the lower this line comes down and we have more disease developing. At the same time, we've also seen an increase in precipitation. Um, <clears throat> this paper didn't talk too much about precipitation, but there are other papers that in uh, scientific papers that indicate Canada has seen about a 10% increase in the amount of precipitation over the same time period. And as a result, as I mentioned before, infection periods will become more favorable for some pathogens. The other kicker in all of this is that dew has also increased. Uh, with rising temperatures, air can hold more moisture, and so the relative humidity is increasing. And uh, we certainly experienced that this summer. We had a long, prolonged, uh, humid summer. And uh, granted, some years are not as, not as humid as others, but on average, I believe the summers are becoming more humid. And we can see that <clears throat> in the form of, uh, of uncomfortable days in terms of, humid, in terms of the humidex, but we also see it in the terms of dew formation on plants. And the dew is forming earlier in the growing season and it's more frequent, and uh, the daily dew periods are, are longer in duration because the, the dew formation tends to be heavier at night than it used to be, and as a result, it takes longer for the dew to dry off in the morning. And so they're, they're, the dew periods are longer, and as a result, many pathogens can infect during these dew periods, and that becomes an issue. And if you're interested in, uh, in the relationship of dew formation and temperature and humidity, you can go online and pick up uh, any of these websites that, that point out the dew point temperature. But it is interesting to be aware. So let's say you're at, uh, at six o'clock in the evening, 6.30, seven, you're eating your supper, finally after a long day, <clears throat> and the, it's been a muggy day, the humidity is at 70% right here. And in order for dew to form, the temperature just needs to drop down to 18 or 19 Celsius and you've got dew formation. Well, there was a time when that didn't happen until perhaps 10 or 11 o'clock at night because our, our uh, humid periods were a lot drier. Now they're much higher. And so the dew formation starts a lot earlier, perhaps at eight o'clock at night and it doesn't dry off until 10 o'clock in the morning. And that creates a long humid dew period, a time that uh, many pathogens can infect. So as a result, uh, this can go, the infection cycle can go around and around uh, much more rapidly because we've got all of these favorable conditions. And, uh, <clears throat> and finally, before we move on to the overwintering stage again, we've got the colonization phase. Um, very often we can't see what's happening in the tissues and that we refer to as the latent period. And uh, the pathogen grows in and among the plant cells at that point in time. And uh, during, this, during this phase, as I mentioned, we may not see the disease and uh, it can last up to three to, or 21 days or even longer depending on the pathogen. We think everything is okay, but really the thing is, is uh, brewing inside the host. And once we see the cells beginning to die, then that's when we see disease symptoms. And that expresses itself as spots or leaf drop or wilting, rotted fruit, dead plants. And that's typically when we become concerned. And here's an example of what colonization of a fungus looks like on a blueberry leaf. At this point in time, and this is a special microscope that we have at the research station. And it's called an epifluorescence microscope. Um, it allows us to see the activity in the, in the leaf and um, uh, at this point in time, there are no symptoms on the outside, yet look how extensively colonized the tissues are between the veins of the leaf. 
and the fungus is growing along the uh, the veins and then it expands out between the between the veins and uh, there's a lot of growth going on eventually the nutrients are depleted in this area and it shows up as disease and uh, that's what we see finally but prior to that time a lot of activity was going on inside the plant here's another example of veldensia on blueberry a large growth occurring here uh, in amongst the cells. And this particular organism also produces a toxin ahead of its growth. It dissolves the, plants, uh, the plant cells and then it just simply sucks up the nutrients and continues merrily on its way through the leaf. Eventually we see symptoms like this on the blueberry plant. Fungi on the other hand uh, have all kinds of symptoms. Um, these are all local symptoms on, on Brussels sprouts, strawberries, cucumber, beans, and tomato, for example. These are all examples of disease that show up after the colonization phase. And I wanna to touch briefly on the bacterial side of things as well at this point in time. Here we have another example of, of uh, open stomata on, a, on the underside of a strawberry leaf. <clears throat> and in this particular zone, maybe a, a section like this here, very small, and that's what we're seeing, it's bounded by the leaf veins. We have about a dozen or so uh, stomatal cells that uh, allow the plant to breathe. If we have enough adequate moisture and temperature and the bacteria, if they're present, they can multiply on the strawberry surface. And here we see bacteria, um, individual bacterial cells, and they will simply spill over and uh, fall into the stomata, into the open stomata. And uh, if it's raining hard, the raindrops will actually push these bacteria into the stomata and that just gives them a boost. And once it's colonized in the, in the plant cell, if there's no more room, the, the cells are all damaged, the, the bacteria just simply multiply and they push back out through these openings. And we see that as bacterial ooze pushing out from the stomata. And this is a, <clears throat> the undersurface of a strawberry leaf with angular leaf spot. Eventually, the leaves turn into these symptoms and uh, we can become very concerned. And especially if the disease goes on to the calyx of the strawberry and this becomes unmarketable at this point. <clears throat> Briefly on uh, fire blight of apple, the same situation occurs, uh, fire blight on apple as well as on raspberry. And in this case, the bacteria don't uh, penetrate the leaf that way they go through the, the, the nectar thode or the nectar producing pores of a flower and uh, the bacteria enter there and from there they move into the rest of the plant and once they've colonized the plant they start to ooze again once the tissues die they start to ooze we can see the ooze here on the apple and we can see the ooze here on the raspberry plant and uh, the bacterial ooze is then dispersed by rain or by insects to another suitable um, infection site so the colonization latency and symptom phase, um, <clears throat> it occurs uh, in amongst the plant cells. And uh, once the nutrients are depleted, um, the pathogen needs to reproduce itself and it, it may get ready for overwintering after that. And uh, it can uh, also produce long-term survival structures as we've already seen. So the organism can cycle many times or it can go through its cycle once a season. So what does this happen? What does this look like in terms of the disease progress? It starts out with a very innocuous or really unobservant cycle. Maybe the first cycle in the growing season is really very, very small. We're not too concerned about it. We don't become too concerned about it until we start to see disease developing. And after a few weeks, we might see a lot more disease developing and, and as the cycle, as the pathogen cycle go through its infection cycle, and we come, become very alarmed, of course, as it really cycles and we've got a raging epidemic on our hands. <clears throat> and the, 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 the disease progress curve can be explained by the lag phase where we really don't see much disease at all. We may not see any disease. Then we have the exponential phase where we start to become alarmed and we may actually have an end phase to it. And the end phase can occur at various levels uh, I've shown it here, drawing up to, at the very top where the disease actually starts to level off. And it levels off because there's no tissue left for the pathogen to grow on. All of the tissue has been consumed. Or it may end up uh, down here, even a lot lower. And uh, the end of the season, maybe the crop has been harvested. 
or the or the frost has occurred, so it, uh, the disease can't progress any further. So this line can be variable. And uh, more often than not, we're more concerned about this portion of the epidemic, of the disease progress curve, because we don't want to end up here. We're more interested in what can we do at this end down here. And of course, there's an emotional component to all of this. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, once that infection cycle goes around once or twice, we're really unaware of it. We don't really see any problems. Once we see that as the infection cycle intensifying, we see more disease, um, we, we have this tendency, well, maybe I should uh, look into this. Maybe I should get some advice on this. But we get busy and uh, maybe for two or three weeks and then we come back to our fields, oh, things are getting a little worse. Uh, maybe I should have phase uh, enters our minds. And after, we get, after a number of cycles further down the road, three or four weeks later, we end up really saying, I really wish I had uh, gotten some advice on this. And we end up having uh, perhaps even crop failure and uh, disappointment and uh, perhaps even worse, panic sets in. So what can we do about the overwintering stage? <clears throat> and uh, if we can control this stage, we can inevitably control much of the rest of the cycle. And it certainly will control the reproductive stage. What can we do to reduce initial inoculum or, st or the starting inoculum of the, of the entire infection cycle? Well, one of the most important things that we can do <clears throat> is, the, uh, is crop rotation. And crop rotation is, uh, is the practice of rotating out of a field for three to five years. And we use that as a rule of thumb by planting other non-host crops. And the pathogen will eventually die out. It'll die out in the soil as the crop residue is consumed. <clears throat> and uh, it, its, survival, its survivability um, has been exceeded. And, uh, and the value of crop rotation is that if we, didn't, if we didn't do crop rotation, we have a high initial inoculum. So when that first infection cycle begins, we have a high level of inoculum being produced. A lot of spores are being produced. And that sets us already at a disadvantage. On the disease progress curve, we're already high in comparison to when we do do crop rotation, um, disease onset may be way, way ahead in advance where we've pushed this curve way forward in the, in, the, uh, season, in the growing season. And we may not end up having much disease at all. In contrast, we have higher level disease beginning and as the crop, as the infection cycles increase, we have more and more and more disease at a faster rate than when we do not do crop rotation. So crop rotation is extremely important. And uh, unfortunately though, some pathogens can persist for many years and they require a lot longer rotations, but that's the reality of, of the situation we're in with farming. The other aspect is to consider tillage. If the crop can't be saved, if we're on this very steep trajectory, uh, till it in as soon as possible. If you've got crop insurance, you know, and the crop inspectors have come out, uh, till it in as soon as possible. That, that sets your stage for the future. You're getting rid of the, uh, the, the crop, the disease crop as soon as possible. If you've been successfully successful in your harvest, uh, don't forget that disease continues afterwards. You may have taken off the product. It's already, it's already gone, but on the leaves that are left behind, the stems that are left behind, the disease will still continue to find a way to multiply. And so <clears throat> it's, it's best to destroy the crop residue as soon as possible after harvest. The same holds true for greenhouse and tunnel sanitation. Again, you can be viewed as a crop rotation. If you, if you, if you sanitize your greenhouse growing operations, um, you can delay the onset of a, of, a, of a disease. For example, gray mold, you can significantly delay the onset and uh, in comparison to uh, a higher level of onset and a much more rapid increase in the, in the greenhouse uh, situation. In Ontario, for example, the greenhouse growers there, they have large expanse of greenhouse operations, some 50 acres. There are many 50 acre complexes and they're run like surgical, surgical hospital rooms. They really do follow strict, uh, strict sanitation measures. They will gather up all of the old crop residue. They will wash and sanitize all surfaces and destroy the crop residue. <clears throat> uh, 
And uh, uh, I would also add that they get rid of their debris. And uh, uh, a, a rule of thumb is don't, don't throw it on a compost pile nearby. And the, the compost pile that you have most likely is just a trash pile and it's not a true compost pile. A true compost pile will, will uh, have temperatures in, ex in excess of 55 Celsius for a minimum of three days. And I doubt whether many of our compost piles really achieve that. And the downside of a compost pile nearby is that the pathogens will survive in that trash pile and they will, re they will act as the initial inoculum for the new growing season. The same holds true for sur survival on storage bins. If you have a diseased cabbage, for example, um, that diseased tissue will stick on the wood bins and uh, it'll survive for, from one storage season to the next. And if you happen to put in healthy material, the healthy material makes contact with that dirty, uh, with that diseased uh, material sticking on the wood bin, you will end up having uh, 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 some decay occurring in storage. And you'll wonder where it came from. And so the best thing to do is wash and sanitize those bins at the end of the storage season. The next thing we can do is, uh, what can we do about dispersal? Um, dispersal is, uh, is, is the means of the organism moving from one locale to the next. And uh, so we start with clean uh, transplants. If you're, if you're transplanting product uh, from, uh, uh, into your fields, uh, obtain the transplants from a reputable nursery. Um, you know, strawberries, raspberries, grapes, fruit trees, for example, or even, even uh, nursery uh, vegetable transplants. And if you're growing them at home uh, in, a home, in a home nursery, uh, keep the nursery clean, good sanitation practices, <clears throat> and uh, the dispersal of many pathogens to production fields can be avoided by using clean nursery stock. And if a pathogen that's encountered that can be spread on equipment or clothing, um, work in that field last to avoid spread to healthy fields and wash and sanitize the equipment before moving to a healthy field. And uh, we can have a look at this example of, of club root. Club root is a, is a disease that we have here in the Maritimes, but it's also a disease occurring uh, across the Western provinces in canola fields. And it's a very, very serious problem out West. Uh, the organism will colonize the roots and it'll cut off the water supply causing extensive wilting of the plant. And it'll produce these clubs and these clubs are filled with spores. And once the clubs decay in the soil at the end of the growing season, they can last in that soil for 20 years. And uh, the decline of the, uh, the spores is really not that much. It, it, they, they stay viable for, for many, many years. So on a local scale, um, <clears throat> Uh, we're seeing that club root is being spread from field to field, and uh, it's, it's clearly occurring in, on uh, um, mechanized equipment, on our tractors, on our, on our implements. So if you do have club root, or for that matter, any other disease that is, a, that is spread on your equipment, um, a good idea is to work those fields last in a day's cycle, uh, so that at least you're not uh, moving that uh, organism around uh, to healthy fields and then wash your equipment. And in out west, the canola growers, they are now forced to wash their equipment before they move from field to field. Thousands upon thousands of hectares have been infested with club root where they can't even grow canola anymore or the yields are severely in, uh, reduced. And so they have adopted a very strict pattern or, or program of washing their equipment and sanitizing the equipment before they move from one field to the next. And it's become a necessity for them to be able to grow canola successfully. Another aspect is, um, and if I get my slides here in order very quickly, is uh, sequential plantings. If you're planting uh, a crop and then you've got a second planting uh, followed by a third and fourth, your first planting most likely will have little disease. The second planting will get more disease and it'll be an exponential growth. And we can see that by the end of the fourth planting here, we may have a lack of disease occurring here. A simple way of uh, preventing that from happening, and it's not always practical, I realize that, but spread, spread some geographic distance between plantings one and two perhaps, and between plantings three and four, you'll have a lot less disease occurring between your plantings. 
The next phase is the germination phase, the infection phase. What can we do there? Um, plant away from trees, increase airflow through the, through the field. Um, use trickle irrigation if possible, and that reduces foliar wet periods. And if you can't uh, uh, use trickle irrigation, you're, you're bound using, to using overhead irrigation. Uh, perhaps you could time it to uh, coincide with the natural dew periods. Start after the dew periods begin at night and maybe even early in the morning. And the uh, temperatures are usually lowest at this time of night, which reduces pathogen germination. And give adequate planting space and keep the crop weed free because this also improves airflow, resulting in shorter wet periods. And finally, when needed, apply fungicides to prevent infection. And we'll touch a, while, a little bit on fungicides. Jen Jennifer Foster is going to be giving us a talk in a few weeks' time on, um, on fungicide activity, and we look forward to that. But I'm just going to discuss a little bit about fungicides. Fungicides, of course, give us a protective layer on the plant and in which the spores cannot germinate. And that's a simple, a simple mode of action that they have. If we don't do all the other practices on a regular scale, we've already set the stage for perhaps failure. Uh, disease level is much higher at the beginning of the season, and we're trying to knock it down using multiple applications of fungicides. And even multiple applications may not work as well as we would like. So we have to, be, we have to implement our other applications, our other uh, cultural practices to reduce the initial inoculum, and then our fungicides will work much more effectively. And perhaps we have to start even earlier during the uh, disease progress curve. When we first see the disease, don't wait, get it on as soon as possible. And that's extremely important when using biologicals. They need to be put on fairly early. Um, an, infect an, infect an effective fungicide program would look like this, where we've got an infection cycle occurring, disease is showing up, the next spray application is going to have a, a significant impact on that uh, infection cycle. The next application is going to have an even greater impact, as opposed to an in, ineffective fungicide application program where the, uh, where the disease cycles just continue and we have a raging epidemic which can't be controlled. So a few pointers about fungicide effectiveness. Identify the pathogen causing the disease. Most bacterial diseases are not controlled by fungicides. So it's really important to know the difference. Sometimes they look alike. You might think it's a fungal disease or a bacterial disease. So you need to know the difference. Get some advice on, on what disease you have. Know the infection cycle of the pathogen. When does infection occur during the season and, and under what conditions? Choose the proper fungicide or combination of fungicides for the pathogens present. Today, the fungicides tend to be specific and uh, one size does not fit all. There was a time when we used to apply fungicides and they would, they would control a, a broad spectrum of, fungi, of fungi and uh, that's not the case today. Our fungicides today are very, very specific and Jen will likely talk more about that in the upcoming uh, seminars. <clears throat> Apply early in the disease progress, and if necessary, bef before the infection and symptoms begin. In the case of apple scab and blueberry monolinea blight, they're already applying in April. They know that uh, infection is likely to occur, so they want to get uh, protectant on much, much before we see symptoms. And the final, uh, and another one is good, good spray coverage of foliage. Many pathogens infect on the leaf underside, so we have to protect the underside of the leaves as well. So check your equipment for correct nozzles, pressure, boom, height, uh, ground speed, all of these uh, physical factors are important in getting a proper application on. And don't rely on systemic properties of some fungicides to make up for poor coverage. Many of our modern uh, fungicides have this marvelous property called systemic, systemic activity, where it simply means that the, the chemical will actually penetrate into the plant and it'll redistribute and it'll prevent uh, spores from germinating where the fungicide perhaps did not get to. However, we can't rely on that activity to make up for poor coverage. And then during prolonged dry weather, repeat applications may be saf safely delayed. You can wait, hold off, but watch weather forecasts for upcoming wet periods. You want to get it on before a, a wet period happens. And then uh, do not make more than the allowable number of applications per season. And this pertains to fungicide resistance development. 
Um, <clears throat> many of our fungicides in, in today uh, have uh, restrictions on the number of applications that can be used. And you can find this information in production guides as well as the fungicide label. And finally, rotate chemical groups. These are called FRAC codes of fungicides to avoid resistance development by the pathogen. Consult the production guides and seek advice. And um, <clears throat> our modern day fungicides, they belong to different groups. So you may have three or four different fungicides. They all belong, they may, that may belong to one group. Don't mix that group or don't, don't use those fungicides sequentially uh, if they're all in the same group. And uh, as a result, as I've shown that with the yellow arrows, we may have fungicide failure or resistance development. And uh, you may not get any disease control because the, fungicide, the fungus has become resistant to that group of fungicides. And that becomes a problem for everyone because resistant spores do not stay on a, in one place. They do spread around to other farms. So rotate your chemical groups. I've shown that by the yellow and red arrows and uh, ultimately you will have a bigger impact on the infection cycle. Uh, and finally, uh, if we can control most of the uh, uh, components of the infection cycle, we'll have a much better, better, better chance of, of, of um, controlling the disease. Finally, the, the uh, colonization phase, <clears throat> I didn't touch upon, I just slipped through my thumb wheel here on, this, on, the, on my mouse. Um, use disease resistant varieties where possible, and I recognize that's not always possible, but check it out. Don't over fertilize. Many fungal and bacterial pathogens, they love, they love plants that have been fed with excess nitrogen, and over fertilization can also cause excessive growth, uh, dense plant canopies, and increased wet periods as a result. And finally, if you're pruning plants, um, do this at the right time of year and especially during dry weather, during active growth. So sanitize your pruning equipment because many pathogens are dispersed easily on that equipment. And I'll leave you with, the, uh, with a final slide. Um, perhaps you find yourself along this disease curve and uh, I'll leave you to fill in the blanks. And you might say, maybe I should uh, check, out, check it out. If I have a persistent disease problem, maybe I should ask for some advice. Maybe you're at this stage, oh, I should have uh, maybe done a better job of calibrating my sprayer. Maybe I should have done a better job of getting the right nozzles for my sprayer. Or maybe you, you've experienced this level here. I really wish I had done some crop rotation. I could have avoided much of the heartache. So remember, so whatever, whatever we can do to reduce the infection cycle, we can also reduce uh, the disease progress curve. And so seek advice when in doubt about a disease problem. Don't assume that it will go away because it's likely not to do that. And get an early accurate di diagnosis and uh, you know, any advice that you can find uh, from a crop specialist from Perennia or any of the other crop specialists that are in the area, uh, seek that out and uh, hesitation can be costly. So I think I'll land this plane there and uh, entertain any questions that uh, may have arisen. Thanks very much, Paul. That was absolutely excellent. Um, there's been lots of great questions coming in in the Q&A chat and also, uh, yeah, also in the chat. Uh, Sujit, do you want to lead us through some of those questions? Yeah, excellent presentation, uh, Paul. Uh, I will go through those uh, questions uh, sequentially, uh, one by one. Uh, so the first, uh, our first question is uh, from, from Jeff, that uh, uh, what if uh, you cannot do uh, crop rotation, for example, when you are dealing with perennial crops, for example, lobish blueberries. Yeah, obviously crop rotation can't work there. <clears throat> so we would, we would scratch that off the infection cycle. And what can we do about the other, uh, about the other components of the infection cycle? So you're, you're forced to advance your thinking onto the other part of that infection cycle. Um, and there are, you know, certainly, uh, with, with the blueberries, low bush blueberries, for example, you're almost forced with looking at fungicides only and fertilization only. There was a time when we would burn prune. Burn prune was a form of sanitation, but uh, uh, the restrictions on burning have become uh, prohibitive. And uh, also the cost of pr burn pruning is also very prohibitive. 
For those of you that don't know, lowbush blueberries are pruned every other year. They used to be pruned by burning, by putting straw in the field or by oil burners. And that would get rid of a lot of the diseases that were affecting lowbush blueberry. And uh, unfortunately, with those restrictions that I mentioned, um, they do now flail mold. They do flail mowing to get the plant to regenerate. And uh, that's done on a biannual basis. So yeah, uh, we recognize that uh, uh, crop rotation can't work in a perennial system. In an apple system, uh, rotation can't work either. So that's where sanitation is going to become increasingly important. And this year, many of the apple growers have recognized that. Um, we've, got, we've had a series of restrictive uses on some of the fungicides, and uh, we can't use certain fungicides that had broad spectrum activity. So they're off the table. So we have to use these uh, selective fungicides. They're more costly. They're not as broad spectrum. They don't do perhaps as good a job. Um, and so sanitation is going to become uh, critical for the apple growers. And sanitation is done by applying urea in the fall or early spring to the leaves that have fallen on the crop. And uh, the urea actually acts um, as a means of encouraging the leaves to decompose faster than they would normally. And the mowing action just enhances that decom decomposition action. So you can actually reduce the amount of initial inoculum quite substantially by doing uh, urea applications coupled with mowing. And uh, that will allow the fungicides to be that much more effective come springtime when they're needed. Thank you, Paul. The next uh, question is from uh, anonymous attendee. What is the best way to deal with leftover plant material at the end of a growing season? Uh, <clears throat> If you have a field, if you know what you're growing, uh, I'm assuming you're, you're interested in taking it off the field or, um, uh, well, let's, let's, let's answer it from this perspective. Let's say it's a crop that you've harvested cabbage, cauliflower, uh, potato, well, potatoes or tomatoes, something like that. Make sure it gets tilled in properly. Um, don't leave it on the plant, don't leave it on the soil surface. As much as you, if you can get most of it incorporated into the soil, uh, other organisms, soil organisms will decompose that quickly and it doesn't give the chance, it doesn't give the, the uh, pathogen a chance to set itself up for winter survival. Um, in a greenhouse situation, if you're removing crop debris, the best thing to do is to uh, move it away off farm. Don't put it in that uh, so-called compost pile because chances are it's not actually a compost pile. It's just a trash pile. So in Ontario, for example, the growers there, the large greenhouse growers, they have had to, they've been forced to uh, come up with means. And many of the growers have, have contributed to biological digesters where some of the, the growers will have, have converted some of that uh, debris into um, usable methane gas to generate electricity but in so doing, it also produces a good compost that they can market. And to those particular growers, they are now accepting biological material from other growers that don't have these facilities on hand. And in so, in that, in so doing, they are getting rid of a lot of their biological material. We don't have that, uh, we don't have that privilege here yet. And so, you know, take it to, uh, a true compost uh, facility here where they do truly compost the material. They try to get the temperatures up, which will kill all of the pathogens that are of concern. And that includes human pathogens as well. So I hope, think, hopefully that's given you some ideas. Yeah, I think Paul, you have covered part of the, the next question. It is from the same uh, anonymous attendee. What do you recommend for sanitization of equipment or, uh, or high tunnels or greenhouse with bleach? Example. Yes, um, there are many products available, and you can. You, all you have to do is Google uh, sanitation products for greenhouses, uh, something like that. And I think you'll find that bleach is probably the most uh, one of the most effective, ten percent solution of bleach, and it's also the least costly. It's not very very expensive at all. So make sure that you. Uh, Talia has put out a great, and and, and Rosie have put out a great. Uh, uh, fact sheet on sanitation of greenhouses. You can see it on their website, but in short, it uh, they just describe it. Remove all the, as much debris as possible, 
and then uh, wash it down with soap, uh, with detergent, followed with the sanitation with bleach and a 10% solution of bleach, spray it on, let it sit for 10 minutes and then rinse it off. And uh, that's an important step because some of our equipment will rust otherwise. If you leave the bleach on and let it dry, it'll start to oxidize and cause rust problems. So simply wash it off and uh, it'll, it'll, it'll go a long way to sanitizing equipment. And that's what the canola growers are actually using in the field. They have mobile washers out west. They have mobile washers and uh, they are washing their equipment, then they sanitize it before they move from one field to the next. Uh, next question from Thomas. Um, uh, how effective are disease models at predicting infection risks in field? It will depend on the model, of course, but how well do they tend to work overall? Um, <clears throat> yes, thank you. There are, um, there have been many models put forward for many diseases. The two models that I showed you with the monolinea blight of blueberry, it was developed here in Nova Scotia. We developed that at the Kenfield Research Station and uh, it's very accurate in predicting when infection occurs um, on blueberry. The apple scab model has, was, it was developed in uh, the US, but it's also been proven over many decades here at Kenfield. Uh, it's been proven to be accurate. And uh, these, these models are, are used to uh, help us gauge when infection might occur. So for example, when it, we watch the weather forecast, if it's supposed to be wet, but, but very low temperatures, we can probably hold off on our fungicides. If the temperatures on the other hand are very, forecast to be very warm, um, and we, can, we would probably want to put on a protective fungicide on the crop. So models in general can be very accurate, but uh, many models are produced in various, in various regions. And so those models may not work for your particular geographic region. And for that reason, they require a lot of effort on the part of researchers or extension people to test them out to see if they work. So should you adopt some of the models for your farm? Uh, it may be a good idea, but I would do that in conjunction with a, a crop specialist uh, from Perennia who would uh, have access to the original models and uh, probably access to people who have experience with using them. So I would talk to them uh, uh, to get some advice on, on their use. Thank you, Paul. The next question is about biologicals. Uh, do, they, do those biologicals work in a field setting? Yes, they can. Uh, products like something like Serenade or Serenade Opti or Serenade Max, <clears throat> um, they, they do work. They don't have the knockdown uh, that the synthetic chemicals have. And when I refer to knockdown, I mean that they don't uh, prevent infection to the, to the same extent that a synthetic product would. The reason for that is that most biologicals, they have to be applied um, early on um, they are living organisms, so they have to colonize the tissue for the most part, and uh, they have to they have to uh, colonize the niches the niches on the plant surface where the pathogens would normally infect. So they have to outcompete the pathogen, and for that reason, it takes a little bit more time. And so biologicals um, they do they do require to be put on uh, at an earlier stage of the crop cycle and the infection cycle and uh, perhaps more applications. And that's the downside. They are expensive. And uh, uh, I, su I suspect though, as time goes on, the biologicals will become less expensive as more people adopt these programs. And again, um, consult with your, your crop specialists. Um, they would have experience or, uh, themselves or they would have access to experience and uh, they could provide additional advice on the use of biologicals. Uh, for, for disease control. Thank you, Paul. Um, the next question is about planting density. Does, the, does plant, uh, dense, uh, reducing planting density help to reduce the spread of pests and diseases? Uh, yes, it does. Um, <clears throat> the reason for that primarily is because uh, it reduces the wet periods. If you've got a very, very, very dense uh, crop canopy, um, chances are that the wet period is going to be a lot longer down in deep down in the canopy as a result of rain or dew. 
air can't get in there as easily as if it were spread apart just a little bit more. And we certainly see that with carrots. Um, uh, we, we fortunately, we don't have as big a problem as the island does with white mold and carrot. Um, and uh, in, in carrot, for example, they've gone to a wider planting density just to get better airflow through the crop to prevent infection. And uh, they've also taken it a step further. They've got a, a, a cutting system where they actually cut the canopy to improve airflow so that they reduce the wetting period. And uh, carrots really aren't harmed that much by this, uh, this mower going through the carrot canopy, mowing it off, mowing it off particularly off the sides so that air can go down the row. So yeah, if you're in the habit of planting um, uh, even leafy vegetables at a very dense canopy, uh, that, that produces a very dense canopy, you know, I would suggest to open it up a little bit by planting a little bit further apart. Uh, next question, uh, Paul, I think you have covered uh, a part of it, but uh, I will just reiterate. Is there an effective way to treat deb debris removed from a greenhouse or tunnel used to grow strawberries, which had botrytis before, that is organic peroxide, uh, such as sanidate? Yeah, um, <clears throat> in that particular case, um, you would probably want to move that debris. Not don't don't put it nearby because that that is a tra that becomes a trash pile, and botrytis would be very very happy overwintering on that material. And come spring, it would be very happy producing a lot of spores. And if the wind is blowing in the right direction, it'll just find its way back into the greenhouse. So the best way is to um, uh, contact uh, the, Enviro, the Enviro Depot, see if they would take some of that uh, material. You would have to, you'd have to probably pay for it, I'm guessing, but maybe not. Um, the other thing is, if you have a field available, put it in the field, spread it, a lot, spread it in the field, and disc it in. Um, if you're not going to be growing strawberries in that field, if you're growing soybeans or corn, uh, it wouldn't, those crops wouldn't be bothered by, by that botrytis. So just simply disc it in, and uh, let nature do its, uh, do its thing in decomposition. Thank you, Paul. The next question is from uh, Jackson. Can you recommend a biological fungicide effective for controlling gray mold on strawberries in a greenhouse? There are so many now on the market. Have you, have, 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 have you, they're asking about your experience about root shield and pre stop um, <clears throat> root shield and pre-stop, I believe those are, those are soil-borne uh, uh, biologicals, so I, would, I, would, I don't think that they are useful in your context. So you'd be looking at something like Serenade, as I mentioned previously, Serenade Max. And uh, Serenade Max does have a reasonable activity against um, botrytis. And uh, if you want to try it, um, uh, try it. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spray the whole greenhouse with it. I would do a section of it, uh, resort to your synthetic products if you're, if you're open to that and uh, on the rest of the crop and uh, see how well Serenade does. Uh, Serenade would be a, um, a good organism to try, a good, a good biological to try. But again, I'd have to look through the list of available products and to see which ones um, have activity ag against botrytis. And you could check with um, Sonny Murray. He's the, he's the fruit specialist. And uh, he would uh, be able to look that up for you. Thank you, Paul. The next question is uh, about club root. Um, are there methods for containing club root infection other than washing equipment between fields? I have, I, uh, you have mentioned the use of cover crops at field entrances as a way to help reduce the spread of club root. Um, I didn't, there, there aren't any chemicals, uh, well, I shouldn't say any. Um, oh, I'd have to check the production guide. I'm not sure where the chemical called fluazinam uh, stands. I, I think it has a registration for club root. Um, you can dip transplants in that solution, I believe. Um, other jurisdictions in the States and in Australia, they use that product, but I'm not sure if it is registered for use in Canada. <clears throat> In terms of, um, I can I can speak to that. It's not. I don't believe that's registered in Canada, and I believe it won't ever be registered in Canada. Well, okay, okay. So we're left with uh, sanitation. You know, make sure we don't spread it from field to field. And uh, like the Western growers, where where thousands of hectares now are 
they can't grow canola because of club root, they are forced to clean their equipment. And uh, they've, they've gotten around that by, by having mobile washers doing it for them or doing it uh, uh, on site. <clears throat> so that's one approach. Um, the other thing I would add is uh, if you've experienced club root in one part of the field and you know it's there, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of your crop rotation, don't plant that part of the field to crucifers or brassicas in the near future. Just leave that for, for another crop. Um, that'll help to uh, prevent spread. Um, when you work up a field with club root in it, you're dragging those spores uh, across the field. And uh, so if you've got an area of the field where you know the club root has occurred, you've harvested the crop already, work that field, that part of the field last. And then remember where that part of the field is for future reference. Maybe don't plant in that area and keep good notes. You know, where, how many feet over from the tree line was that problem, et cetera. Uh, cover crops don't really reduce um, the viability of club root. Those spores will last on their own um, through, through many years of various uh, cover crops. So cover cropping uh, to try to reduce club root uh, is not that terribly effective. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next question is, is, is there a, a no-till alternative to disking or tilling uh, in, in, effect, uh, in affected plant debris other than composting with the appropriate temperature? Um, is there a difference between plowing and disking? No, he's asking about the alternatives. So instead oh, of disking it, and tilling. It, okay, well, any, any means that you can to uh, cover as much of the debris with soil as possible. So if you can cover the debris with disking, you know, use that. Um, if you need a plow to, to bury it deeper, um, that would be fine too. Depth, depth doesn't really have a great impact. As long as the debris is covered, um, the microorganisms in the soil will, will decompose that plant debris and uh, reduce the chances of survival for those pathogens. Uh, the plant pathogens that we're concerned about. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the next question you have already answered about the sanitation, like how much time, which solution should be used and how much time it should be deep there. So I think for this, they can check the, uh, the, the, the fact sheet. Uh, I will move to the, to the, uh, another question. It was about crop rotation. Um, uh, okay. Uh, the next question is when you see press, uh, precipitation coming, like if there is a forecast, forecast of the precipitation, is there an optimal amount of time to apply uh, before that rain comes? I think it's refers to the, yeah. Yeah, most, most of our modern fungicides, they, re they would require about a four to five hour uh, drying time between um, application and the onset of the wet period. So um, I, I'm saying four to five hours is usually a rule of thumb. Um, in, the, in the upcoming uh, talk by Jen, I'm sure she's going to uh, talk a little bit about that. To, but I think most of the fungicides require that type of a drying time so that they are either absorbed or, or, or nicely adhere to the, uh, the foliage before the rain has a chance to wash it off. Thank you, Paul. Uh, uh, the next question is, uh, could botrytis and threcnose and powdery mildew survive or they can overwinter? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that question. Yes, Paul, uh, the, it's about the, uh, the question is, can botrytis and threcnose and powdery mildew survive or it can overwinter? Yes, oh yes, absolutely. Um, and Theracnose can easily survive on strawberry um, in the debris and uh, uh, botrytis will also survive in the debris, the dead debris and uh, powdery mildew will also survive on that material. Yeah, powdery, thank you. Powdery mildew, powdery mildew has a little, a slightly different mode of survival. It, uh, it does produce um, structures called Cleistothesia and that really is the, uh, the starting point of infection. But those Cleistothesia are, are found on the debris. And that's, those, are the those are the starting points of, uh, of infection. The spores are released from those 
those structures on that dead debris. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next uh, question is, uh, is, is a mixture of comment and uh, question. Uh, I was not aware of nitrogen impact on disease. Is there a guide here or, or how much nitrogen per acre to mitigate diseases referring to, it's, it's in the perspective of low bush blueberries. So it, 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 with, with respect to low bush blueberries, uh, check with Hugh on the recommended rate. <clears throat> Years ago, there was a, there was a, a, uh, uh, a push to, to heavily fertilize the crop to get it to grow up high. <clears throat> and uh, that, that created an ease of, 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 um, of harvesting. The mechanical harvesters were able to get a better crop off uh, because the, the stems were a lot taller and the brushes were able to collect the berries more effectively. So there was a push to get the crop to grow higher. We saw, we saw an increase in Valdensinia blight, uh, Valdensia blight, the, some of the images that I showed you. And uh, uh, I think the, the going rate for nitrogen application per hectare is about 30 kilograms per hectare. Um, that's the going rate now. <clears throat> Back then it was some, some growers were pushing it up to 40 and uh, we saw an increase in disease. We did a little study that uh, compared the effect of, uh, of overwintering and the amount of disease and we saw a 12 fold increase in the ability of the fungus to overwinter on, uh, on nitrogen or high nitrogen fed leaves. And that said to us, okay, we can't afford to go too much higher on nitrogen because it's just going to favor the pathogen. In other crops, it's very difficult to, you know, most people haven't done a quantitative study to say how much more nitrogen will affect disease. But it's a rule of thumb that, uh, that excess nitrogen uh, can adversely affect the, uh, the susceptibility of the crop. And one thing that uh, uh, I've experienced, and I even experienced that in, in, at home as, as a teenager, um, <clears throat> try to avoid the, the temptation to, to boost the crop early in spring. If you've got your nitrogen into the soil, you've done a pre-plant nitrogen application for horticultural crops, for example, the temperature is cool, the crop isn't growing, you wanna, you wanna push it a little bit along, the nitrogen is there already. There probably isn't a need to add more nitrogen. Uh, the need is for warmer temperatures to come along and uh, make that nitrogen available to the, to the plants to use it. And so avoid the temptation to give them an extra shot of nitrogen. So, because what happens invariably is when the, when the warmer temperatures do come along, we have a much more lush growth occurring. We think we're okay, but in actual fact, it's, it could work against us by creating more disease, allowing more disease to develop. Thank you, Paul. Those were all the questions and there are many, uh, many notes about your excellent presentation. So uh, it's highly appreciated. Okay, I, I'd like to thank uh, Rosie for inviting me uh, to do this. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Rosie, this presentation will be available on the Perenni website. So, growers will be able to access it and just run through it. Uh, some of the, the concepts that we've discussed here today are a good um, a toolbox to review um, once a year, perhaps, just to see where you fall on that infection cycle, that disease progress curve and your understanding of, uh, of disease development. That's exactly right, Paul. So um, this session has been recorded. Um, and it will be posted on our, our website or on our YouTube channel. And um, all of the attendees will get the link emailed directly to them um, uh, when, once it's posted. Um, so uh, there was a link that was posted in today's chat uh, for, uh, for our post-workshop survey. So if you could please fill that out, uh, it'd be much appreciated. We always want to try and serve um, the industry better. So if you have any advice or any feedback, we always love to see that. Uh, it should take you about 10 minutes to fill out. Um, again, this, the QR code for CCA CEU, CEUs is up in the top corner there. And, um, and you can just take a picture of that to get your CEUs. 
Um, please join us for the next Getting Into the Weeds session, which is next Tuesday, November 30th from 12 to 1, when Dr. Sajid Rahman will take us into the weeds, exploring some of the trends that we saw over this last growing season and how we can learn from them. Paul, that was an excellent, excellent presentation, and we thank you very, very much for your time and your, uh, and your knowledge. You're welcome. And I think that concludes today's session, and um, thank you all. <laughs>